we're just going to jump into the talk because as Dr. Milani said, there's going to be um, a lot of Q&A. But before I do, I do want to send a thank you and um, shout out once again to Professor Adan Keshavazian and Professor Alim Yusuf Plessy for putting together the workshop that led to the edited volume Global 1979, from which our chapter and our talk today is taken. So let's see if technology is our friend. All right. On January 7th, 1968, Ghulam Reza Tahdi, Iran's beloved Olympic winning, gold winning wrestler, um, was found dead in the Tehran's Atlantic Hotel. Newspaper headlines announced that he had committed suicide, apparently by ingesting poison. Almost immediately after the news of his death began, began rumors that Tahdi had not killed himself, but had been killed by the Pahlavi state. I knew this was going to happen because it didn't won't move. You have to, everybody, I have to stop one second um, and see. There we go. The morning ceremonies for Tahdi quickly became a political flashpoint, culminating 40 years, 40 days after his death, into full blown demonstrations organized by university students across the country. As one student activist put it later, the mourning ceremonies for Tahdi's death um, became a, quote, political explosion. It allowed university students to successfully create ties with and mobilize a large swath of people from workers to government employees on a multi-city scale. As a result of this event, students got their first taste of large-scale political organizing, some were imprisoned in its aftermath for the first time, which only expanded their political networks. And for those new to activism, Tahdi's 40th in particular was their first public demonstration in the streets, a sensation that they would not experience again until the late 1970s. Two years later, from the 40th of Tahdi, many of the networks behind, Tahdi, behind the demonstrations for his 40th actually organized a citywide strike in Tehran against a planned increase in bus fares. In response, the Shah withdrew the announced hike. This was deemed a victory for political, for student groups in particular. Um, and it's actually very strange, and it's something that Ayash and I just touch on on our article, that subsequent, subsequent historiography of Iran in the 60s and 70s and the revolution had seemed to have forgotten this moment altogether. Um, it was important for the participants because they saw it as one of the few bright lights in the decade that came to see intense political activity, but that was forced underground or abroad until that is the revolution gained steam in the late 70s. Our talk today is taken from our jointly written chapter published in a new book titled Global 1979, edited, as I mentioned earlier, by Aran Keshavazian and Ali Musa Pasi. Um, Arash is a political theorist, I'm an historian, and together we came, we, each of us individually saw this as an important moment. Um, and we came together to argue that Tahdi's 40th was a watershed moment among various segments of society at the time, particularly among former students who remember and memorialize it to this day. Yet it's marginalized both in the historiography of global 1968 and that of Iran's 1979 revolution. As such, our chapter is both a work of historical reconstruction and theoretical construction. It intervenes in the historiography of the global 1960s and that of the 1979 revolution in Iran. And doing that allows us to shed light on the history of student activism in the 60s and 70s, particularly in expanding the importance of the concept of CNPCSC in this period that Arash is gonna to touch on later and the shape and meaning of Global 68 in the Iranian context. In our article, we argue that historicizing and contextualizing Tahdi's 40th demonstration explains a mobilization tactic used to great effect in the lead up to the 1979 revolution, the staging of protests on the 40th day of mourning after a previous set of protesters had been felled by state forces. Locating this tactic in 1968, as opposed to the late 70s, allows us to reperiodize the history of 1979 
at a moment before ideological disputes between the leftist and the Islamists become, con became congealed. The question we started our article from and our way of thinking about it from, um, in order to understand this phenomenon was a simple one. What insights can we glean into Iranian history from the fact that the funeral for Mohammad Mossadegh, arguably, arguably the only other national figure in Iran's modern history as beloved as Tahdi, did not become the type of political flashpoint that Tahdi's became only nine months later, considering that the repressive nature of the state did not perceptibly change in those nine months. And what can we understand about the nature of mobilization and protest in the 1960s, both in Iran and globally based on this difference? As our time is short um, in our talk today, we're gonna present some of the historical narrative we constructed. The article has much more details about how the demonstration around Tahdi's 40th came to be. We will then give you a brief history of university student activism in the lead up to those events in 68. And we're gonna end with an analysis of the significance of this, as we mentioned, both for the revolution and for the idea of Global 68. Tahdi was, and remains to this day, one of the most beloved national figures in Iran. Born in 1930 in the neighborhood of Khaniabad in Southern Tehran, he was a wrestler who throughout the 1950s won multiple championships, both at home and abroad. But in what seems to be a confluence of his age and the state creating obstacles in his path, his athletic success turned to defeat in the 1960s, even as his popularity among people remained as high as ever. In a passport application for a trip to West Germany in 1965, Tafti identified his current job as, quote, railway, railway employee. Um, I apologize for the graininess of this photo, it was the only one I could find. Um, Tahdi was the first Iranian wrestler to win an international gold medal in 1956 for Iran. He continued to regularly do so, both in Olympic Games and other global wrestling competitions, casting him in Iranian parlance as a world figure, a Jahan Pahlavan. But his skills as an athlete alone cannot explain his enduring popularity. Rather, Tahdi's popularity was predicated on stories about his moral exemplary, um, exemplarity. From his ties to Mossadegh National Front to his public charity throughout the turbulent 1960s until his death, Tahdi became or came to be seen as a figure of opposition to the Shah and a champion of the people. And one of the events that Arash and I talk about in our article is actually what Tahdi did um, when the massive earthquake um, hit Buin Zahra in 1962, it was 7.1 scale. Um, and that photo, as you can see, was Tahdi at the earthquake site. And I just, for just a sense of the rubble, I put the picture of Queen Juliana of the Netherlands going to the same site. In retrospect, it comes as little surprise that the announcement of his suicide um, in the hotel room, nonetheless, was met with a flurry of rumors that rejected the official story. Unwilling to accept the notion that a legend of such grandeur and popularity would take his own life, many believe that they, quote, suicide at Tahdi, a reference to the Shah, um, that, that the Sabah suicide at Tahdi, a reference, of course, to his feared and despised Secret Service. The more newspapers and officials insisted otherwise, the stronger the rumors became. Here you can see in the newspapers connected to, um, newspapers at the time connected Tahdi's suicide to family strife and actually focused on his wife Shahla, his difficult marriage and the despondent Tahdi. Um, to quote Shahla, from the first day I got engaged to him, he said, if I ever have the courage, I'll kill myself, even though he was very scared of death. He was sensitive and irritable, zudrange and demanding. He didn't speak much and thought more. He was stuck in the midst of life's chaos and its problems. And he didn't know what he wanted or why he was dissatisfied. Despite all of this, large portions of the public rejected these explanations out of hand, instead circulating creative interpretations of their own. Rumors spread at such an alarming rate that one Savak report later regretted the state's policy of not, of not giving his mourning ceremonies actually greater media coverage. 
popular discourse about Tafti as an ethically decent and political man facilitated the rumors of spread. Sabat documents from the period showed that the idea of Tafti having been Tafti having been killed by the state cut through the entirety of Iranian society, from Tehran to Abadan, from women on the streets to soldiers in government buildings and military conscripts, and from jewelers in the bazaar to students in the university who decided to weaponize the public's discontent against the Shah. In response to the whispers, authorities decided to, quote, not prevent his memorial services from being held so that the propagation of harmful and untruthful information can be neutralized, end quote. Now, mourning ceremonies for his burial in around the seventh day of his death went without a hitch and were even covered by the heavily censored press that noted tens of thousands of people had participated in the ceremony in Tehran. Photographs like this one show throngs of men in the street as far as the eyes can see. The article reports a crowd consisting of, quote, athletes, students, asnaf, guilds, craftsmen, pishabaran, and people from the provinces who gathered at the ceremony to place flowers and photos on Tafti's grave from, quote, 10 in the morning until nighttime. But the newspaper reports did not reflect what was said in and around his gravesite. We now know that Savak had informants among the crowd, many of whom said de sent detailed reports of what was being said. One student representative, for example, intoned, quote, we do not know if they killed Tafti directly or indirectly, but we agree with all of the people in saying that Tafti was martyred as a champion in the pursuit of freedom. Tafti did not die. He lives on in the hearts of each and every individual Iranian, end quote. Similar events took uh, place across the country as students took to microphones and transformed his death into a malleable metaphor. At a morning ceremony in Isfahan, one student argued that Tafti could not have committed suicide without any reason. He said, quote, in this country, they don't treat people with humanity. There also aren't any real men. Even if a real person does exist and wants to do something, they chain him, they humiliate him. Tafti was one of those, one of those people who couldn't tolerate bullying. And we have a lot of these um, such examples. Now the newspaper coverage of Tafti 7, however partial it was, indicates that these events successfully skirted the line between impermissible political opposition and permissible mourning ceremonies. The quote, political explosion that took place on Tahti's 40th would cross that line, rendering that watershed moment strangely invisible. One, or as far as we have, we have not been able to find newspaper reports either before, on, or after the 40th day of his mourning. Now, having organized events across the country for his seventh, that walk this line between the political, apolitical, and the permissible and the impermissible, students embarked on a novel enterprise. They used the permission to gather collectively as part of a mourning ritual to organize cross-class political protest. 40th day demonstrations had never before been sites of street protest. Inhabiting a practice that was neither clearly relig religious nor secular, the students expanded the possibilities of communal politics. None of this was inevitable as it may seem so today. And so thus on a cold day on February 15th, 1968, 40 days after Tahti's body had been found in the Atlantic Hotel, the public mourning ceremonies primarily organized by university students started from Shush Square in the south of Tehran and continued to Ibn Bavye Cemetery, where Tafti was buried, a distance of roughly five miles or eight kilometers. News of the event had already circulated through leaflets scattered around the country, uh, around the city. Um, a student named Dawud Sohdus, for example, um, was later on put on trial, as you can see, for being a member of the Palestine group, had printed, according to reports, as many as 200,000 leaflets in an underground print shop that had announced this gathering for the 40th. Um, the students of the Polytechnic College also planned on printing and distributing 10,000 copies of a signed declaration that began with the famous line of poetry from the poet Yovashikastravi, which we took our title from Castro, sorry, 
Um, every night they pull a star down and still this mournful sky is drowning in stars. That declaration went on to insinuate that Tafti had been killed. Leaflets and posters were not just printed in Tehran. We have a Salat report that tells of students in Mashhad University who had printed a thousand copies of a 13 page bulletin of poetry in praise of Tahdi. Um, they intended to send all of this to their contact in Tehran. Salat notes that um, they arrested and detained all the parties involved for engaging in what they called quote, communist activities. When compared to a poster for Tahti 7th, which you can see on my left side, you know on what your side is, um, the language of the posters announcing the 40th ceremonies, which is the one with Tahti's picture um, on it, we can see a distinct confidence that had accumulated over a month long successful campaign to organize. Unlike the one for the 7th, the one without the photo, um, the one that has the photo, which is for the 40th, does not ask the people of Tehran to join the students in mourning. It tells them, quote, we are gathering at Tahrir's grave on the 40th day of his absence. Um, we have plenty of evidence that workers appeared along student activists. And for the sake of time, I won't get into the details, but we're happy to show you the ways in which the students had actually been able to mobilize um, with, uh, work, with workers to distribute a lot of these pamphlets and to take um, um, part in these activities. The one thing we'll show you, I'll show you here is that, um, for example, you, we actually have police intelligence records that indicate that even the employees of the railway in Tehran, of which, as I mentioned, um, Takti had been an employee, uh, they stopped working at 10 a.m. to attend Takti's 40th. And it says that they returned at noon. At the 40th, students shouted um, slogans such as, quote, oh, laborers, know that Tafti has been martyred. Oh, workers, know that Tafti has been martyred. Or Iranians, know that Tafti has been martyred. And Tafti has been martyred, but the movement continues. From that call and response that tied various sectors of Iranian society to Tafti, slogans that were shouted at the time included, praise to Mossadegh, praise to Khomeini, death to this dictator, death to the murderer Johnson, and a free Viet Cong is a victorious Viet Cong. There were also celebratory references to former leaders of Iran's Tude Party, the Communist Party, such as Tari Arani and Khosro Ruzbeh, both of whom had been political prisoners, alongside calls to free political prisoners in Greece. In many ways, the slogans chanted in 1968 read as a blueprint of the revolution that was yet to come. The crowd took on a different tone when they left the, left the cemetery and spilled into parts of Southern Tehran. There were more sustained chants of death to this dictator and more slogans connecting that moment to the Punzai Khordad, the 15th of Khordad moment, movement that had begun in Rome. 1963. Um, 1960, yeah, exactly 63. Um, to Mossad, uh, the chants also, as I mentioned, talked about uh, included Mossad there, and they of course included chants about Duru Berkhomeini himself. By Savak's own account, it was around Shush Square when the pro procession ran into the police, who seemed to have absolutely no problem dispersing an already fracturing crowd. Perhaps not surprisingly, Tafti's 40th is not actually connected to any arrest of known or soon to be known people. Most arrests occurred weeks later, like those of the members of the Palestine group, several of whom have been active directly like Sohdus in organizing and implementing the 40th. In many ways, the success of Tafti's 40th is what emboldened many other student groups to step up their activities. Years later, after the revolution, when post-revolutionary events had, been, had drawn an almost permanent marker, lines between the left and Islamists, some participants would actively deny there had been any pro-Khomeini slogans at Tahdi's funeral. But at the time, and from the perspective of the participants, as well as the security apparatus, there was really no qualitative difference between the wide array of slogans that were being shouted. As Arash is gonna address next, quote, sociological classifications and identifications were in flux at that moment. A confluence of chants and groups 
that could qualify as both Islamist and secular leftists, a confluence that was unique to Iran, would reappear again in 1978. Farash? Can you hear me? Okay, so for the remainder of this presentation, I would like to address two questions building on what Nadma has already offered and going a bit deeper, both historically and theoretically. So the first of these questions is how exactly did student activists come to use the tactic of Chehelom, 40th day mourning ceremonies, uh, in order to mobilize in response to Tahti's death? To re return to an earlier question that Nadma raised, why January 1968? And why not, for instance, March and April 1967 after Mossadegh's death? How did the tactic of mobilization used following Tahti's death emerge? Or put simply, what is the history of Iranian student activism in the 1960s? So that's the first question, and that's the historical one that I'd like to address um, a bit deeper. The second is uh, concerns the quality or the feel of the mobilizations following Tahti's death. In other words, the idea that, quote, sociological classifications and identifications were in flux in Iran. And this quote or characterization comes from a French theorist by the name of Jacques Rancière, who was writing about the famous May 1968 protests in France. And those events, it's important to note, were, are commonly understood as touchstones to talk about global 1968. So if there was a similar disruption of sociological classifications and identifications in Iran, as we're suggesting, and for that matter, if that occurred five months prior to the events in France, then it would be fair to ask, how does the history of mobilization in 1960s Iran revise conceptions of global 1968? So the answer to both of these questions, uh, we argue in the article, lies in a distinct set of organizing tactics that are called Senfi CRC. And these tactics crystallized and became prominent in Iran after 1963, when opportunities for formal political opposition to the Pahlavi state uh, through electoral politics had closed. So I'm gonna say a little bit about this concept of Senfi CRC. It's a central concept for the argument that we make in the article. The term senf literally means guild in Persian, but in practice, and especially in the 1960s, it came to signal any corporatist group in society distinct from what was officially considered political or CRC. An increasingly stark divide emerged between state power and radical opposition to the Pahlavi state. This opened up a sphere of nominally non-political activity. Student activists shrewdly took advantage of this sphere or opportunity as the space for semi-formal political opposition closed. What was happening in Iran was not detached from patterns of student activism beyond Iran. During the Cold War, international student organizations from the West defined student activity as non-political, focused on the interests of, quote, students as such, while those from the Eastern Bloc demanded that students take explicitly political positions. States aligned with the West, like Pahlavi Iran, uh, treated forms of social and political life unaligned with the Soviet Union as non-political. In the mid-1960s, however, this is um, the context that matters for our purposes, Congresses from each respective poll approached one another's respective position in order to garner legitimacy and recruits from students on each side. Okay, so back to Iran itself and what was happening there. The figure of the student rose to prominence as a political actor in 1960s Iran with a dramatic increase in university enrollment and a gaping void left by the repression of established political figures critical of the Pahlavi state after the 1953 coup. Students played a pivotal role in the permitted political opposition of the Second National Front between 1960 and 1963. But when that window of opportunity closed and the domestic political calculus changed, students who had cut their teeth on semi-formal opposition turned to activism on behalf of students as such. So for instance, in 1963, a Senfi organization appeared in the Polytechnic Industrial College of Tehran. Its first bylaw declared that it held, quote, absolutely no political position or jambit, and under no pre pretense should its existence be used for political activity. Its express focus was on student housing, financial assistance to needy students through a cooperative, 
the management of cafeterias and libraries and shuttle services, curricular decisions and exam procedures, student safety, and the administration of tuition fees. It was led notably by non tude affiliated leftists. In 1963 at the Polytechnic College, students protested the implementation of, uh, of tuition and mixed their demands with chants about the, na the National Front. This changed by 1967. So by 1967, tuition protests reemerged at the universities of Tehran and Tabriz without making any overt or formal political demands. Students at universities in Tehran and Tabriz organized on behalf of Senfi student interests, starting with tuition costs and then eventually uh, dormitory conditions, curriculum, the academic calendar, and control over student services without any explicit political demands. Their efforts became most pronounced at the end of the 1966-67 academic year, which notably happened after the death of Mossadegh, when they staged strikes in Tabriz and Tehran. These activities, uh, these activities covered a deeper, hidden political organization connected to the Fadai. Just as importantly, these instances of student activism did not register uh, among the state as either disruptive or riotous even when protest actions left the confines of university campuses and spilled over into the streets. A commission was um, put together that visited both universities in Tehran and Tabriz at the time, and they wrote evaluative reports for the prime minister, Hovay Da, that argued uh, that, uh, that effectively sympathized with the students' tuition concerns, arguing that increased fees had not amounted to improved services in student welfare. So it, this goes to show the extent to which uh, the demands were actually um, allowed for or permitted within the framework of the state. Organizers of the protests were punished with obligatory military service in the summer of 1967 at most. It's the success of this Senfi organizing in the spring of 1967 that explains the use of Tahtiz Chehelom or 40th to organize protests and not Mossadegh's death nine months prior. Consider Tahdi's status and significance in contrast with Mossadegh's. The latter, Mossadegh, was obviously and decidedly political. There were no ifs, ands, and buts about it. Tahdi, however, embodied two activities that could provide cover for political opposition, much like student activism on behalf of student interests as such. And in Tahdi's case, those activities were sports and charity. So um, it's notable here that there was a, an article published by Hossein Fekri in January, on January 13, 1968. And this was the first public statement to formally insinuate that Tahdi did not commit suicide and that the state was uh, lying. Uh, if you could change the slide really quickly, it's just a brief um, representation of the article itself. It's not insignificant uh, for our purposes that Fekri, who wrote the article, who penned the article, had grown up alongside Tahdi, with whom he maintained an enduring uh, friendship, and that he was known as the father of football in Iran, and that he published the article in a sporting magazine. The Tahdi processions were an opportunity to turn simple mourning into political protest after student activists had experienced successful Senfisiasi mobilization. And that resulted in an unprecedented mode of demonstration in January 1968, one that could disrupt, quote, sociological classifications and identifications in much the same way that the line between the Senfi and the CIC was challenged and dissolved. So this brings me to the second question, the theoretical one that I wanted to raise. In addition to inviting a different approach to thinking about the 1979 revolution, our article invites a different approach to understanding the uprisings that took place across the world in and around 1968, from Saigon and Tunis to Paris, Prague, Chicago, and Mexico City, a series of events commonly referred to as Global 1968. What can the Tahdi protests teach us about the conceptual frameworks commonly used to understand uprisings and revolutions? Can we write theory from Iran as opposed to taking theory from elsewhere, most often Europe and North America, and applying it to places like Iran? What's the relationship between the general and the specific? Why is it that for over half a century, people have believed that nothing of consequence happened in Iran in 1968 when Tahdi died? What does this pattern in historiography tell us about the policing of history? So the language I used there was deliberate, and that language comes from uh, the book that you see on the slide, 
Kristen Ross's May 68 and its afterlives. Kristen Rock, Kristen Ross tells the story about, uh, tells the following story about the historiography of the May 68 protests in Paris. Sure, Ross says, demonstrations took place. Um, this is according to the common story, uh, but people have dismissed them as a momentary outpouring of cultural discontent expressed by students with no bearing on politics because they did not bring about real change. This characterization is brimming with sociological classification, the cultural as opposed to the political, the momentary as opposed to real change, and finally students as opposed to other ostensibly political actors like workers. For Ross, scholars who adhere to these classifications are the police of history. The police keep people, places, and things where they purportedly belong in order to facilitate circulation and order. Scholars mired in categories perform a similar operation at the level of ideas. Ross calls this the police conception of history. So in a similar sense, scholars of the Iranian revolution rarely mention the processions turned protests following Tahti's death. Readers are led to believe that nothing happened in 1968 in Iran, or at least that nothing of consequence took place. This is due in part, I think, to the overwhelming attention given to ideology and analysis of the revolution. A generation of scholars paid disproportionate attention uh, to the 15 of Khordad protests in 1963 and the subsequent exile of Ayatollah Khomeini. And so they told a story about Islamism, either about how a national and secular revolution was hijacked by Islamists or about how the revolution was in fact Islamist. As I see it, our article directs discussions of the Iranian revolution to 1968, in addition to, or perhaps even instead of 1963. So to just illustrate and give you an example, even the most creative interpretation of Chehelon, 40th day morning processions as protests in 1978 repeats this trope despite itself. The fourth chapter of Charles Kurzman's The Unthinkable Revolution in Iran, which was actually recently published in Persian translation by Nashrine, I believe, uh, argues that Shia ideology did not inspire 40th day protest events, claiming instead that they were invented in the process of revolt itself. But Kurzman incorrectly dates the origins of that invention to 1963, overlooking the Tahti protests altogether as if nothing happened when in fact the tactic first appeared and developed with Tahti's death. Drawing from Ranciere, Ross tells a story about Persian students disidentifying, uh, excuse me, tells a story about Parisian students disidentifying uh, from their social position as students when they joined with workers and the colonized in May and June of 1968. This story becomes a kind of standard for talking about global 1968 in a celebratory fashion evidence that something did in fact happen. Seen from one perspective, our article takes the dynamic that Ross attributes to the spring of 1968 in France and locates it five to six months earlier in Iran. Iranian student activists took advantage of the malleability afforded by Tahti's 40th, the possibilities afforded by bringing together people from so many different walks of life under a single banner. The processions turned protests on Tahti's 40th were significant because they involved disidentification. Mobilization based on ideology implies identification. We identify with the call of one ideologue as opposed to another according to our given place in society, sociological classification, and we mobilize as a result. Disidentification, by contrast, involves unlikely conjunctures across expected social class identities and categories. On Tahti's 40th, student activists did not mobilize on behalf of their corporatist interests as students, issues like tuition or dormitory conditions. This was also not just a matter of criticizing the state or of expressing solidarity with global revolutionary struggles. As Nafim actually notes in her prior research, other activist groups later used mobilization for issues beyond Iranian borders, like Palestine, as a viably legitimate cover in the military court. What made the Tahti processions turn protest a disruptive event were its conjunctures, how it combined secular and religious, local and global students and workers. Now, it matters that the Tahti processions in Iran occurred prior to events in France. 
The difference encourages a reconsideration of the similarities between events in France and events in Iran. Disidentification occurred in both, and yet a different kind of disidentification occurred in each. Iran saw a different kind of conjunction, not just between students and workers, or even the local and the global, but also between the Senfi and the CRC. Phrased differently, Iran's 1968 isn't just a specific manifestation of global patterns, but rather, by virtue of its specificity, an opportunity to reframe so-called global patterns. Ross, following Rancière, describes police uh, politics as, as a break from the police order. Rancière's framework invites new interpretations, as our reading of the Tahti uh, protests demonstrate. And yet, nevertheless, the crude application of Rancière's framework or of a concept like Global 1968 can render possibilities from other parts of the world invisible. For instance, despite his best intentions, Rancière sees a stark difference between common sense behavior before a revolt occurs and the logic that emerges in the midst of revolt. By contrast, the Senfi Siasi organizing that I described in the 1960s in Iran um, indicates and its reappearance in a novel form in 1968 with the Tahti protests indicates that non-political appearances practiced before an act of disruption against a police order can somehow continue during the disruption itself. So then, what would it look like to write the history of the 1979 revolution in terms of this identification? The point here, or the objective of this article, has been to revisit and reconstruct the history of the Tahti processions during protests in early 1968, so as to reframe the tactic of 40th day mourning processions used by activists a decade later, over the first half of 1978, when protesters did what Kurzman calls the 4040. In this sense, the article, we hope, offers one route onto reinterpreting the Iranian revolution and to reinterpreting it in a matter that heeds the truths missed by the police of history. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. We both uh, look forward to your questions. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, turn on my camera. Uh, 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 first of all, I want to thank both of you for a very wonderful, uh, thoughtful uh, presentation. We have a few uh, audience uh, questions, but before uh, we get to those, uh, I would like to uh, pose some questions uh, and uh, some uh, uh, ideas. Uh, one of the things that was, I think, missing from this uh, very fascinating presentation is the role of the Iranian Confederation. If you're trying to get student activism historically placed uh, before the Tahti demonstrations in Iran, Iranian students outside were organizing mass demonstrations. Iranian activism outside, I think, is part of this discussion. Uh, you compare Tahti's uh, funeral to uh, Mossadegh's, uh, but the reality is that Mossadegh's funeral was banned by the Shah. Uh, Hoveida, as I have tried to document, suggests to the Shah that we should allow a kind of a funeral, uh, and the Shah overrules it. So Mossadegh's uh, funeral was banned, Tahti's was uh, permitted, and then the students began to engage in that. And then uh, if you are, uh, in terms of the history of uh, Semfi CRC, Shunzai uh, Azar, Iranian student activism, in a sense, predates Tahti and predates uh, 1963. It's after the, the killing of those three students in 1954. And that becomes uh, almost every year at universities in Iran. I, I taught at universities in Iran before the revolution. Around Shunzai Azar, there was a student activism, never on the size that you are uh, suggesting. But your uh, rethinking of this history, I think, is very fascinating. Uh, but I, I thought uh, 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 these points uh, were my observations. Uh, one uh, 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 reference you quickly made, and I would like the, to pose the first question. Uh, from 64 on, we have the organization of the Mujahideen and the Fadoyan. 
you do refer to the role that the Palestinian group might have played in organizing this. Do, is, did you find any evidence that uh, the early uh, embryos of the Fadoyan, uh, I think Professor Davari referred to Fadoyi in passing in one word, but uh, Mujahideen or Fadoyan, their active role in using these demonstrations for their political ends. Thank you very much. Uh, if you can, uh, if you want to briefly respond to my comments, then we'll go to this, uh, the question and answer. Uh, the first of which, uh, of course, is who killed Kathy Tahdi? I'm gonna, um, I think I'm gonna let, um, if Ayash is okay with an answer the student question. Um, and I'll do, because I raised Mossad uh, in my talk, but um, I want to say that, you know, for next time, we suggest you give us two hours and we'll get into all the details. Um, our article is, in fact, I think 40 pages. So, um, and you raise absolutely excellent points that are important to be accounted for and are accounted for. Um, we had to, as I mentioned, summarize everything um, for this talk. But, um, you, I, I, I put in the Mossad the comparison, um, which we have also in our text in, on purpose, because we do something very specific with it. We do not say, why did people come, not come out with Mossad there, but people came out with Ahdi. We're not doing a popularity contest or looking at the state of repression, because that is the easy answer to give. And you're absolutely right, it was banned. We're saying, what can we understand about the state of a, a whole series of historical and political events once we have this control group in some ways, right? Where we know what the state of repression was, we know one was banned, one was not. But considering that, we can ask, say, for example, why did the response to Tahti not be banning, right? When he was so incredibly popular. And what can we understand from that? So we're not necessarily interested in saying, why did one happen, what did not happen, but saying starting from the basis that one happened, one didn't happen, what can we understand about the history of the period? And what it allows us to understand, of course, is all the stuff that we talked about, particularly how Tahdi's death itself was treated as a Senfi CSC moment, as that line between the political and the apolitical and the permissible and the impermissible, which as you quite rightly point out, you could just not do that Mossadegh. Mossadegh was fully in the realm of the political. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanna um, maybe further affirm, first of all, thank you for the questions and thank you for the invitation. It's an amazing event and opportunity. Um, I wanna kind of further affirm what Nagma was suggesting, which is that one way of thinking about the project, at least for me, is to consider um, the quality of Senfi CSU organizing. How can we describe Senfi CSU organizing? And so I think the Tahti event and the kinds of student activism that we're describing and we're focusing on uh, allow us to appreciate that. So you're right to note the presence of the Confederation outside of Iran. Um, but one of the benefits of organizing outside of Iran was that one could be explicitly political. Um, and one could make direct political demands and present direct and overt political spectacles. And so the interesting point for our purposes is what are the limitations placed on student activism within Iran? And then how are people creatively uh, navigating those limitations as they organize and as they mobilize? And so this may be a way for me to answer um, your question, which is absolutely right about the presence of the Mujahideen, the presence of the Fadai and their role in this story. And they absolutely played a role um, from the research that we've done, but it was behind the scenes. And that's the aspect that's really interesting. So the mention that I made is actually of two Fadai students uh, who were based at the University of Tabriz at the time. I did oral history interviews with them in Iran. Um, and that kind of informed the research here, which is that they played a central role in the process of student organizing, but uh, none of the demands, the overt demands were Fadai demands. None of that appears in the archive. Everything was about student control and they took over student control of you know, um, cafeteria services and various services at the University of Tabriz. And they were punished with military service in the summer of 1967. Um, so they were present, but they're not immediately present in the archives. And that itself is kind of gets at what we're 
hoping to reach for, which is the generative potential of century CFC organizing and how it can translate into protests for a figure like Tahdi, whereas, as Nafme mentioned, it really couldn't for a figure like Mossadegh. Uh, again, um, as uh, I think uh, Professor Sora was suggested, one day we should uh, dedicate a couple of more hours to this discussion because it's a fascinating discussion. But to go back to century CFC, uh, has been today, long before all of this, mastered the art of simply CSC. They created hundreds of organizations that were actually run by them, but they were supposedly SEMFI. It's part of the common terms, the strategy of creating united fronts, front organizations, which is which goes back. Uh, but I don't want to, uh, I want to ask some of the questions of the audience. Uh, and uh, as usual, uh, Professor Shahabi uh, asks uh, a very a uh, poignant uh, question about a very uh, common uh, uh, question. Uh, he articulates it in a very different way, very insightful way. So I read the question. Have you an opinion on whether those who call Tahti's death a suicide actually believe that or whether they were consciously lying, which would be something uh, 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 strange when celebrating a man known for his moral integrity? In other words, those who believe Tahti's death was suicide or death? Were they lying consciously? Did you find any evidence? Uh, because we do have some evidence of other people who have been alleged to be killed by Savak, uh, to have been consciously created into a myth. Ash, do you want to pick it up and then I'll take it from you? Yeah, um, I think it's a really interesting question insofar as, you know, some of the material that we looked at, um, people speak about how Tahti was put in circumstances where he would kill himself. And so he's not actually the author of his own suicide in that framing. Um, it's the state for putting him in that position in the first place. I personally find that interesting because I think it, um, uh, makes us question the notion of authorship and agency or the conventional notions of authorship and agency and who's responsible for an act. And so I suppose I would push back on the question a bit because in asking if people were lying, there's a, there's a notion of somebody being conspiratorial and lying and you know devising a story for a certain purpose. And I think even the kind of material that existed and that was circulating that we noticed in the archives, is not necessarily saying Tahti may have committed suicide, but he wasn't, he shouldn't be held responsible for that. The state should be held responsible for that. And it's questioning that material, that archival kind of, those tidbits are actually questioning this framework, framework of you know, somebody lying or not lying. Um, but I'll leave it at that and let Nahme offer some thoughts. I just wanna pick up from, from what I said, and just as a side note to, actually say, you know, Professor Shahabi was one of the first people who wrote this academic piece on Tahti that we built on. So um, I appreciate this question, which I do believe he asked me in the streets of Cambridge only a month ago. Um, but just to agree with everything that I said and just add that for, for us, it was very interesting actually reading really carefully um, the reports that Savak collected from people on the streets, how at the beginning there wasn't this absolute sense that he committed suicide, but a general disbelief what the report what the informants were reporting um, between his death, which, uh, by the way, these rumors happened almost immediately when he was in the morgue and people had collected outside the hospital. What it seems like either through very obvious um, the ways in which discontented and repressed people build theories, time, but also perhaps efforts by those who were more political or more sentient. See, these rumors of disbelief, like how could a man of his character do something like this, then seem to have turned a month later into absolutely a man of his character could not have um, done this. So there actually does seem to be a process by which these rumors formulated themselves eventually into an absoluteness that he did not kill himself. Uh, the other question, is uh, from Dr. Kumars Ngaraglu, who is uh, the curator for Middle Eastern Studies here at Stanford, uh, it's just added uh, to our university is a wonderful welcome. He says, I wonder whether you have thought about the Shah's reaction to these protests. 
I mean, how can we place his famous speech of 6 August 1968 in Ramsar, which is the most important one delivered by him on the universities and higher education in Iran, in the context of Tahdi's death and the protest that ensued following it? Do we know, do we have any, you want to comment on that? I mean, it's an excellent question. No, I don't have uh, an, an answer for you right now, but it's something to certainly follow up on and to take into consideration. The extent of the research that was done for this article um, looked in particular at Hoveida and how Hoveida was assessing uh, student protest. And so we have some material from December of 1968, which is a bit after the date that you noted, um, where Jove does says that, you know, he, he publicly says, and I think it's the Baltimore Sun, he's asked about hippies and student protest in Iran. And he says, we don't have that kind of thing in Iran. We don't have riotous student behavior. And so that really became a pivot point for us, which was to say, how could Jove does say that in December 1968, when there had been effectively in 67, in the 66, 67 academic year, students taking over universities for extended periods of time. Um, and the argument or the interpretation on our part is to say that that taking over since it was on behalf of the interests of students as such and their corporatist identities was not seen as riotous, was not seen as disruptive of how the state was ordering itself. Um, but I think your point about looking at the Shah's uh, speech in August is, is interesting and something we should certainly do for maybe a, a sequel article. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, in the archives that are at Stanford, in the Zahidi archive, for example, there's some interesting stuff on the Otobusrani crisis and the discussion that takes place within the cabinet. Uh, the Shah was away at the time and the Shah's role in finally determining the tension that existed within the cabinet in terms of whether to give in to the student's demand or not. Uh, but there is one anecdote that I have quoted in the book on the Shah that I think gives a sense of the Shah's response. And uh, I have this anecdote from Mehdi Sami, who says uh, there were the student's demonstrations, the Shah was very angry and said, what do these students want after all we have given to them? You know. And he said, I raised my hand, I said, Your Majesty, the problem is that they don't think these things are yours to give. They think these things are their rights. And I think that patriarchal notion that we have given them everything and the students notion that no, these are our rights and we haven't gotten enough might go to his attitude to, uh, towards these things. Uh, can I just add something both to what Professor Milani said and what, um, what Professor Dovadi said, which is that in some ways, if you look at um, the development of this um, rhetoric of the Pahlavi, I, I know the Pahlavi state is not one thing, but going from early, late 67 into August of 68, you actually see what we had been talking, we talk about in our article happening, which is that Initially, the protests of 66 and 67, which were seen as dormitory protests, were seen as Senfi issues, which is why you have tons of evidence and the Queen came and that the Queen basically intervened in doing that. She was the figure, and I don't need to tell this in, in, in the presence of Dr. Milani, but you know, she was the figure that you trotted out for the social and the cultural, right? You did not trot out the king for the political. Um, and the fact that she was involved in, in solving this dispute about tuition rises and dormitory and food conditions in 67. Um, and then you have the King's speech in August of 68 addressing student demands shows actually the argument that we are making that January 68 was this turning point in which the students took things that were considered sen fee and just put them into the streets. And in doing so, they turn student demands and student activisms into a SEMPI CSC or just CSC issues. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, uh, the time is uh, up, but we have a couple of other questions, very important questions. Uh, if you don't mind, we extend the uh, session for another 10 minutes. Can you stay for 10, 15 minutes, uh, if that's possible? Uh, because I, I, I've noticed that almost no one from the audience has left. So I, I think they're, pay, uh, they're still uh, with us. And uh, 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 
Do we, there's a very interesting, I think, a wonderful question that we don't get to. It has no direct relevance to your paper, uh, but it has a, a relevance to the story. Uh, what do we know about what happened to Tahti's family after his suicide? I'm not going to talk about this in front of you, Dr. Milan, Professor Milani, when you have actually interviewed Babak. So um, please, like, that was, because we talked about it before the session started. <clears throat> One of the fascinating things I noticed uh, in that picture, you, uh, in the report you published about his wife, uh, was that they had her with a veil. Uh, and I think one of the enduring problems in Tahdi family was the religiosity of his mother and his sister and the secular disposition of his chosen wife. Uh, I th and for me, it was fascinating the editorial decision to include a hijab image uh, of, uh, uh, but uh, you, I, I have talked about, uh, I, I don't want to talk about uh, that if you don't want to answer. Uh, I, I have written about uh, Tahti in Eminent Persians. Uh, uh, his Babak, uh, Babak Tahti is a wonderful writer. He lives in uh, 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 Las Vegas uh, with uh, his wife, Muniru Ravanipur. Uh, he's written short stories and he's talked candidly about his uh, father and about his suicide and about his um, traumatic relationship with his uh, mother uh, and his effort to, uh, I think, heroic effort to actually tell what he knows of the truth about this tragedy. This is a tragedy uh, all, all around. Uh, I will just add since, because uh, I, I genuinely meant it because you have written about him, but I would just add to what you said that um, one of the things that Babak has been doing, as you know very well, is trying to not just um, talk about his father, but actually try to recuperate the reputation of his mother because the Pahlavi state in some ways did throw her under the bus in order, as the rumors about him having been killed got more and more, part of what happened in the newspapers was of course that he was in an unhappy marriage and he was unhappy because she was of a different class than him. And, you know, we just gave you a small bits of it, but there's a lot there. And over the years, people simultaneously believed that he did not commit suicide, yet he was also in a deeply unhappy marriage because he had an uppity wife. Yeah. And my understanding from my readings is that since then there has been on his part, not just to say his father had problems and committed suicide, but also that his mother was not responsible for the unhappiness of his father, the way in which the press made yeah. it out to be in the ensuing years. And he has talked also eloquently about the difficulty of being Tahti's son, uh, of bearing all of that uh, weight and all of that glory uh, at the same time. Uh, so um, do we, there's a question of, uh, do we know exactly how closely or how uh, tied Tahti actually was to the National Front? Was this an sort of a general affinity for Mossadegh or was he institutionally involved with them in any way? I mean, we, we speak about it briefly that he attended Mossadegh's, uh, the ceremony after Mossadegh's death and that he was um, working with them a, a bit, but it, it, kind of in a direct and indirect way in the early 1960s. Um, but uh, I'll defer to, to Nagmel on this one. Well, I mean, it's, it's what I, I says, but the, my understanding from everything that we dug up is that the belief was that it, the belief ranges in spectrum between he was a sympathizer with J.P. Meli or that he was a member of it. And I think the reason we can't settle on that because a sympathizer and member, there's there's a blurry line in it and it sounded it sounds like he actually inhabited that bl blurry line. We know that he visited Talagani when Talagani was briefly um, imprisoned um, before, his, before Tahti's death. So this is in the late 60s. And that the, what we do know is that there was a strong um, National Front presence at both his burial and at the 7th, which again is why the 40th is so interesting because the students do take over the organization of that event. So, oh. <clears throat> uh, 
the other, <coughs> excuse me. Um, can you talk about how, uh, or do you talk in your paper, the question is, about how the current regime has appropriated and used the Tahdi uh, story to their benefit. And uh, before you uh, answer, I have to say that we can't end this discussion without a reference to Navid Afkari, uh, another Pahlavan, uh, this time obviously, obviously killed by the Iranian regime, not because of rumors, not because of concocted rumors. And he, I think, is the equivalent of the Pahlavan of this era. Uh, Tahdi died of a tragedy. This uh, Navid Afghari died of uh, state murder. So how do they, do you want to, do you talk in the paper about how uh, Tahdi is covered, uh, the story is used or appropriated by the current regime? Not directly, um, but I do think that there's material here that indirectly addresses that, and I think it's worth noting, which is, um, I think that we all need to kind of recognize that when it comes to Iranian studies, that history is a battlefield, and that um, people are really engaging in contemporary political battles um, when it comes to the study of history. And so um, it takes quite a bit of discipline. And I, you know, I think Professor Sorov has written really eloquently about this. It takes quite a bit of discipline to step back from those engagements and to see how history is actually quite complex and muddled and muddied. Um, and I think in at least my investment is to say that the effort to look back onto history and to say that, you know, these were the factions that are associated with my contemporary political interests, or these are the factions that were opposed to my interests, is to impose a set of um, classifications. That's why we spent so much time talking about sociological classifications onto history that make us miss what's actually at play. And what's actually at play is far messier. Um, and, and that it's, it's incumbent upon us to kind of attend to that as good scholars but also because I think it opens up a different kind of approach to contemporary politics. I think that the effort to go back into history and say it was this or it was that, which is what you're implying um, in the, with the question, Professor Milani, is to kind of police history the way that one might police a contemporary state. Um, and I think if we're opposed to policing in a contemporary state, then we should also be opposed to the policing of history and instead open it up to all of the um, unlikely combinations that are contained within it. And in many ways, what's fascinating about the Tahdi protest is that it's defined by, it's characterized by these unlikely combinations. Um, so I think, I think there's another question here actually by Professor uh, Amir Hassan Bouzari that kind of touches on some of this in a really productive way. Um, about Khatami having said that the revolution took place in the context of leftist thought. To what extent do we think that the Senfi part of activities contributed to such leftist thought? Um, I think there's a way that, you know, just the shifting of categories in terms of how Khatami is now talking about the 79 revolution. How is Senfi a thing that signals leftism or is it something that's open-ended? Um, these are the kinds of questions I think that we should be asking when we look back upon the past in order to move away from some of the dead ends that are really characterizing conversations about Iran today. I just want to add to um, what I said as when I'm, there's, he, he covered everything, which is basically we're interested in a different project. We're not interested in, um, in, in talk, a biography of Tahdi, right? We're interested in the 40th and what that does for the larger history. But I do want to point out that Faiba Adel Kha, in addition to Hushang's article, Faiba Adel Kha actually does have a chapter in her book, Modern Iran. Um, that's not called Modern Iran, but her, it's, it's a chapter in her book where she talks about the post-revolutionary um, uses and Tahti's memory in the 1980s and 1990s. Iran and I refer you if you're interested to actually reading that article. Well, <clears throat> we have gone about 10 minutes uh, over time. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that just the last couple of comments that you made uh, for me becomes fascinating is that based on your 
uh, investigation. Uh, the Takhti 40th event was essentially organized by a very large coalition, mostly student, mostly uh, maybe National Front, some leftists. Uh, but by 1978, there is a whole network of religious forces that have begun to more, been allowed by the Iranian regime to mobilize. And the fact that they can then take the leadership at that time, uh, because your, the book is about 1979. Uh, I, I haven't read the entire book, but I, I will. It sounds fascinating. Uh, how we go from this mobilizing coalition, secular mobilizing coalition, to that mobilization tells us about a lot about the politics of the Pahlavi regime and who they perceive to be their main enemies and who they allow to freely organize. Uh, you want to say anything in closing, please? I um, hope. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that Stanford should organize a whole uh, conference on this. And yeah. I think both are actually have a lot to say about this. In the interest of time, I'm not going to get into everything we have to say about this. Just to uh, point out that in some ways, what Arash and I are trying to do is to say that that looking at the entirety of the history that led to the revolution through this lens of something that emerges in 1978, which is the visible leadership of, of Khomeini in particular as the leader of this revolution, and then superimposing it onto the 60s. And even on the early 70s, what we're trying to do by recovering Takhti's 40th is to say that's actually a historical, and I'm really glad you raised it the way you did, um, because we're very much interested and looking at a moment in which you could be leftist, you could be secular, you could be Mossadist, and say Durud Bar Khomeini in Tahrir's 40th, and it does not mark you, and it does not have the implications that it then does in the post-revolutionary period. And it's important to remember that things were not always the way we think eventually it turned out. That way. Yeah, I mean, I think Professor Sohrab, you really said it well, um, but just to go back to some of the um, comments in the talk that uh, secular and Islamists are themselves kinds of sociological classifications that really congeal um, at a later point in time. And I think what's interesting about the late 60s is that they don't exist in that way. Um, and how does that non-existence uh, also reappear uh, in parts of the revolutionary mobilization? And how does that actually make for a revolutionary mobilization? I think those are the, the questions that I, I'm really interested in. And I think that Professor Sohrabi and I were really in grappling with in writing this article. And in your grappling, you have given us much to uh, think and much to thank you for. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and thank you to everyone. I apologize if we went left, late, but it was a, a joint decision. You stayed and we stayed. Thank you for everybody. It was great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.